This is Mouse. I'm Joelle. I'm down in San Diego. I'm the mom one. And I am Weens. I'm in LA and I am the the single one in the film business. And we're going to get right to it. In the wake of what is happening right now with George Floyd, there's a lot of protests going on still. And we thought it was important to talk about it. So we sat down here with some of our good friends to talk, listen and discuss and hear thoughts on racism, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, and what can we do in our own lives and families to work towards a solution. We'll intro these people. First, you're going to hear Ahmed Hassan. He is a longtime friend. He's been on our podcast before. Uh, He calls himself a 46-year-old black man with an Arab name because his father went to San Quentin Penitentiary for six years and became a Muslim. He is a landscape professional in Northern California, best known as the original host and co-creator of HGTV DIY Network's Yard Crashers. He's a dad of three and says he'll be a father to those who need him. He's a green industry expert, and he is a great person. You can find and follow him by searching Ahmed Hassan Landscaper. And the second voice you're going to hear is Angelo Moore. He's an artist, a poet, a musician. He's been the lead singer of Fishbone since 1979 with their slogan being Fuck Racism. He also has many other musical projects and collaborations as Dr. Mad Vibe. One of the projects is The Brand New Step. Another one is Project Infidelica with members of Doc and War and Sammy Hagar. And he's done a bunch of worldwide tours with uh, celebrating David Bowie. And you could be a part of his world, his crazy world, on patreon.com backslash Angela Moore. Then you're going to hear from Marlene Bell. She is from Oakland, California, and has big footsteps to follow because her father was the very first African-American optometrist on the West Coast in 1939, doing amazing things, opening clinics, uh, advising people, and founding Vision Service Plan, VSP. So Marlene then paved her own way. She graduated from UC Davis. She taught in the classroom for 27 years, and she also spent that time conducting teacher training in diversity and later became a union organizer for the California Teachers Association. She became the assistant executive director in charge of more than half the state, um, and she is now retired. She owns a store in Oakland and told us the story about how it was saved from damage the first two nights of riots in Oakland, but then the third night it was damaged, but she had a great attitude about it saying, you know what, it's only stuff, it's the cause that matters. Uh, Now she and her husband Bob run a walnut farm, and you can visit their website at bellranch.net. And our fourth guest is Michelle Harper, an amazing force in the creative and healing spaces. She grew up on the East Coast and had a flourishing career in the beauty, design, and fashion industries, working at Bergdorf Goodman, Saks Fifth Avenue, Barney's in New York. And she was the first African-American woman founder and director of an internationally acclaimed high fashion hosiery company called Look From London Hosiery. She worked with companies in Paris and all over the world, and after moving to California, now works as a clinical hypnotherapist, an esthetician, and she works in sound and energy healing, Reiki, and color therapy. So you can find Michelle at breathefocushypnosis.com, and usually somewhere in Angela's orbit because they are significant others. And then there's the two of us. We are just, we're thankful for these guests. We are ready to learn We're ready to support. We want to help raise awareness to people's stories. And again, this is just friends having an open, honest dialogue that we hope can help. We're going to put information from this and a transcription of this episode on our show notes on mouseandweens.com. And we'll put the video version on our YouTube channel. So we hope you enjoy and please look for more episodes like this in the future. Here we go. My name is still Ahmed Hassan. I'm I'm still a... uh a 46-year-old black man until September, where I'll be 47, who has lived my life probably more so in the white community than I have in the black community. I've had both, but I, I currently reside in Cameron Park, California, which is very white and um, very right. And it works for me. One of the first things my mom said when I told her I was moving to Cameron Park, she was like, are there any black folks in Cameron Park? I said, no, mom, <laughs> you know, I'm the one. 
<laughs> and go in, I live amongst the white people, I show them that we're all the same, and then all y'all come on up the hill. So that's, right, that's what you call a fly in the buttermilk, man. <laughs> that's, that's, it's kind of been the story of my life. It's, it's why yes. I know people like Julianne, um, and it's how I relate to people like Marlene, who lives in Winters, California, because I live there too, and it's not known for its black community. Um, okay. And her daughter, Marlene's daughter and I actually went to the same elementary school in Davis. Mm-hmm. Wow. I was like one of the black families, and she was one of the black families, even though her daughter is probably lighter than Marlene, so nobody really knows what she is. She just has a big old fro. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then there was like one other family, and that was it. So we had some common ground there. But the reason I think that we're all here is because I also grew up with Julianne for a time as a child and met her sister, Joelle. And now these gals have this podcast. And of recent, I've been sharing back and forth with Julianne. You know what? You know what I'm on? I, man, I grew up in a white neighborhood, man, flying the buttermilk, oh. Woodland Hills. My family was one of the first black families in Woodland Hills, California, man. So uh, yeah, and then Julianne was saying you were bussed out of Woodland Hills over to the black community as a kid. No. No. The rest of my Bye. band, Fishbone, band. was bussed out of inner city Los Angeles and the busing program out to Woodland Hills. Sorry. Got I got that wrong. Sorry. You see, that it, that's it. There, there again lies the, the benefit of this conversation because I started out in an all-white neighborhood and I've been living in all-white schools my whole life like Ahmad yeah and um, Oakland Hills being the beginning of that and indelible on my mind Mm -hmm. uh, as an adult yeah because people people know people that don't know Oakland and, and don't really have familiarity with Oakland think that Oakland isn't a black community. <laughs> when I first got to Oakland, I was like, oh my God, there's a lot of Asian people here. I, mm-hmm. I never knew. And the Oakland Hills in particular, especially when you were a child, I can imagine that was not black at all. No, as a matter of fact, that was when my dad had to double D the purchase of our home up in the hills through a Jewish friend. And so his friend would buy the property with his cash deed it back to him. And the interesting thing is, in 1990, he did the same thing in the Napa Valley. He was the first black vintner in the Napa Valley, purchasing land by double deeding it through friends, white friends. The only way to get in there. The only way to get in there, right. You guys were raised more in the white community. Did you experience, like, this conversation off the tales of George Floyd and wanting to have open dialogue. Just wondering what your experience was then growing up. Did you experience oh, I can tell you racism? Very, and I can tell you the very first day of kindergarten for me. And one of the reasons why I became a teacher. I walked into class with my mother like all the other kids. A lot of kids were crying because mom's walking out the door. And my experience was, well, children were led off to a different activity other than focusing on mine. As the teacher led me over to the paint station, she took me by the upper arm, squeezed it to the bone, and said, wouldn't you like to paint? And I knew right then and there where I stood in that classroom as a five-year-old. The teacher teacher did this to you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you see, the racism I experienced in all white settings went from there to being spat on and all kinds of other stuff. But I had to endure because that was my school. And where, where, where was this at again? Well, the, for my kindergarten experience was in Oakland. Oh, in I, Oakland, California. Right, in Oakland. I had, we moved for a period of time up to Victoria, British Columbia. Wasn't as bad there. You know, you could you could survive pretty well because they did not have African Americans as their lowest level of of elitism in that in the, that community. The Native American was the lowest level of well, on the social totem pole, right? The Indian, on the right. social totem pole. That's right. And so, so I I managed to get a step above that. 
So I was not as much a target, but very much a target when I went back to the San Ramon Valley to Danville. And in Danville, that's where I got to get spit on for being African American and in their classroom. And, and that's and where and you and you call it Danville. It, <laughs> it still is. <laughs> See, and I'm I'm kind of ashamed and uh, not ashamed, but we grew up in San Ramon right next to Danville. And I experienced feeling like we didn't have a whole lot of culture there at all. And it, you know, I hit 16, 17 and I went and lived in Berkeley and Oakland for years, but, um, cause I wanted that diversity, but it, and it was very, very, very white. Huh? And I said, you haven't been back ever since. Cause I I've never been back. <laughs> True. <laughs> I know. And then I grew up, you know, obviously in the same spot. And then I'm kind of repeating the same thing with where I live now. I live in San Diego in a super white suburban area with my three kids who have, you know, two or three black friends and that's about it. And we have a couple of families we're friends with, but, you know, not super close with. So I want to do better for the next generation and be more inclusive and what we just were kind of feeling like, I guess that thing, white guilt, white fragility, everybody's talking about, um, you know, but we want to have this platform so we can talk about it and figure out if there's, you know, feelings and what, what people can do to, to help the cause and right. make things well, well, better. That's good. That's good. Cause you know, sometimes I forget, because I keep myself in a bubble the majority of the time, I would rather I would rather consider myself not of this world than am. That's how I keep my art pure and my music pure and, and, and all that shit. So, you know, I know it's a lot of racism out there and everything, but because I because I I've, I've been so used to it, you know, and I, I grew up getting chased chased by rednecks in my, you know, Woodland Hills on the way home from the bus and, and all the rest of that, you know, and, and all, all that type of shit. And I ended up, uh, I, you know, I ended up hating white people. Some good music, some good music came out of it, some good lyrics. I, 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 I embraced the punk rock culture because the punk rock culture was a part of the white culture that just hated everybody, right? Especially white corporate. <laughs> Give them a yeah. choice to, to like him. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, uh, the black, the black culture was always underground anyway. Had to but, be. But all, but all the white boys and everything, you know, out of my neighborhood, all the punk rock that was there, it just gave me a reason to. Uh, hate white people right along with the white people that hated white people too. So I was like, hell man, this is <laughs> my people. <laughs> yeah, this, these are my people, you know, right along. And a lot of black people ended up like, like when it came to me putting my music out and everything, a lot of black people didn't embrace a lot of rock because they felt like it was just white boy music. They call it string hair, white boy music. And we can't relate to that shit. And all oh, nigga, you just selling out. Right. You know, you you just Uncle Tom and it, shit like that. But I'm yeah. like, no, actually, this is like black. This this is like all derived from black music. And so, when my own black people couldn't embrace what I was doing, even in my own household, aside from Richard Pryor, Red Fox, Flip Wilson, uh, um, the the closest thing to rock that that my that that my family got to was Jimi Hendrix. Right. Mm-hmm. And that was the closest thing to rock that 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 my family embraced. Other than that, and and, and the doors, right? But when it got to be a little outside of the doors and, and Buddy Buddy Rich, no. I said it right, but the drummer Buddy Rich, right? Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Once it got outside of that, it's like, oh, Angela, that punk rock shit, you need to, you know, that's, you know, we, we can't, that's just some noisy shit. I'm just like, well, okay. That's interesting. You know, and so that's, that's where, so, but a lot of, other than that, I've, I've realized that I keep forgetting that a lot of white people don't realize that the racism is here. And, you know, this is something I was saying the other day on my show. 
the reason why we have a lot of white privilege and it's some of the last things that people would think about, we have a lot of white privilege because of this. That's right. Angelo is holding up a $20 bill. This guy on the front, Mm -hmm. right? This Mm -hmm. white man doesn't look anything like my granddad whatsoever. If anything, he looks like my oppressor, okay? So white people on a subliminal subconscious level feel comfort when they pull this out and they buy they, 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 they food, they rent, they buy the everything in the matrix that was designed by guys that look like this, that we live in, in this matrix that we live in, right? This provides white privilege to exist. In and of itself. There's no Indian face on here. There ain't no Latino face on here. and There ain't no black face on here. So well, you know, you know, the one black face that could have been on there was delayed until after the Trump presidency mm. has ended. Yeah, Harriet Tubman. Yeah, Harriet, Harriet Tubman. Tubman. Right. So, and so, in the one, and in the right. one Indian face on the Indian head on the on the Indian penny, I, I forget her name, but she was a. a didn't she squeal on her own tribe? I can I forget. That was, but that, was that Sacagawea? Yeah, I think. Yeah. So. I don't remember. Because Harriet Tubman, William, right? I'm Harriet really Tubman sure. had a hairdo that looked kind of like you and Michelle's. I was just noticing that. I got it. <laughs> 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 Paying homage. So I think, I think my experience is probably different from everyone. So I'm from Baltimore. So Baltimore is um, from the black community. You know, I grew up. Um, An affluent family. black community. Well, it's all mixed up. So my parents and my my grandmother was a minister. Uh, she had two minister husbands. My my uh, on my father's side, my mother's side. So I come from a religious background, and I uh, grew up in the black church. Um, you know, so I pretty much grew up around lots of black people. I'm um, southern black people. You know, very kind, very humble. You know, not elite, just basic working class people. And um, I went to school. I was a very uh, talented um, in, uh, well, I, I'll start with this. So my dad, when, when I was four years old, he was shot and he became paralyzed on one side. He lived, he died in his 60s, but I was about four years old. And, um, and so uh, I was very artistic and my dad was going through rehabilitation. So I did a lot of art. So I always had an inner world, probably unlike a lot of my peers, because I spent a lot of time doing art, so I was very creative. So when I went to school, my teachers noticed that I was really creative, and I was very mature, because I pretty much grew up with my dad, because he was learning how to read and write, and could read really early. So that gave me a kind of advantage point in school. So I always had an elevated sense of self, And I was able to participate in programs where I was the only black person Mm -hmm. most of my life. I went to college. I was like, you know, I had like, I had uh, white friends, you know, like kind of like just we, everybody was artistic and creative. So I grew up in a very creative community. And so fast forward, um, I had a, I didn't feel limited because I never felt limited growing up because I was exposed to a different kind of upbringing. And at the time it was punk rock, you know? And so um, I always felt like an outsider, even amongst my peers, even amongst black kids, because they used to laugh at me because I was so creative and I shouldn't, I walked a creative lifestyle. And so, um, and that's how I ended up starting a company. And I started a business when I was very young. And so, but where I felt racism the most is when I started going to trade shows when I started a business. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the only way I would get ahead in the fashion business, and this was uh, based on a recommendation, was to say that my business was owned by a Jewish person. So I was 22 years old. And I started a company and I had to fill out a Dun and Bradstreet form. And I put down that it was owned by Edith and Ira Bergman. And they lived in Australia. (laughs) (laughs) She said she was creative. Yeah, (laughs) she is. 
<laughs> so I had a showroom on Fifth Avenue. And so for many, many years, I was the salesperson. And no one knew that I owned the company. And You're, people, and, that, and I would show not up. not that unique either. Huh? That, that story is uh -huh. very common. Yeah, exactly. Uh, hiding so, behind in, in trying to get ahead and knowing that I'm not going to be accepted as a person of color, as a black person. Oh, yeah. Color is very vague. Exactly. Can, can I ask you this? Because this was brought up saying that our country still is run by white supremacy, white supremacy, Absolutely. which mm -hmm. is confused with white supremacist, which a lot of white people get that confused. I, I think it's both. I think this country has always run on white supremacy. And we have all lived that, learned how to move around it to a certain extent. But it is also run by white supremacists. And whether you call it a person who holds on to title and privilege and doesn't recognize the issues of diversity and inclusion, but maintain the status quo, oh, you are now a country because of who our leadership is, past and present. Um, we are a country that has been run on the principles of white supremacy. And that's why you're seeing people in the street now. They're finally getting it. My problem is, are you going to keep getting it? We've gotten it before. We can go back to Rodney King. We can go back to lynchings. We can go back to all kinds of horrific uh, conditions that cause people outrage. We can go back to the civil rights movement where we were beaten in the street, hosed down. Are they going to keep getting it? And will they show up and vote? Do they understand the value of democracy? They want change. We all and, want change. And is the voting, is the, when, when people vote, because see, we can vote all we want, right? And is it going to count? Is it going to count once it gets there? That's right. Is and it gonna that's count? when, and you know, I, I think that, <clears throat> I don't like to be negative, man, but I just don't think it's going to count when it gets there because, because it's in somebody else's hands that, that, that regular people don't have access to. You know, we, we can't we can't touch, see, or talk to the person that is actually in charge of the person that that is that that's that's the running the votes is. and making the decisions at the end. Yeah, I would imagine the feeling is one of distrust. There's no trust yeah. in the system. There's no trust in people with power, based on history, based on what's going on now. So. Yeah. That's hard for hope. That's hard to have hope in that system. I think that we're going to see change and we're already seeing change. You know, there's there's now this movement to defund the police department. I don't see a parallel movement to ban assault rifles and we can't get a bill to ban lynching through the Senate. Now go figure. Go Why? Figure. Why is that? What is going on there? You have people who have a one person held it up, was allowed to held it, hold it up, and that was Rand Paul. He felt it was too broad. They're arguing over the language. Okay, we argue over language all the time because language is important. It, it, it describes intent and it defines parameters. But one senator is holding this thing up but there's more than one senator. 410 members of Congress approved the language and went to the Senate. The language of, you mean the, the word anti lynching? Anti lynching, because there's a whole anti lynching thing. language. We do not have a law against, against lynching in this country still. There's no law against lynching. Well, yeah, there ain't no, no. law against lynching because this no. shit keeps happening. But you see, there's, there's different kinds of ways to lynch somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the overt and the covert. <clears throat> Which and is we, what just happened. Oh, Which is exactly what happened. That man put his knee on that on George Floyd's neck and lynched him. With and lynched him. him. It didn't with have to bullet. happen. It didn't and have to happen with a rope. And it was posing. That's the harm. Posing guy. while he did it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so lynching is okay in this country, and that's why we've never been able to get language through 
the Senate or the House ever, never mind who was in place, who held it up, never got to the president's desk because they approved lynching. So now what you're seeing on the street is you've had for centuries people who who identify themselves as law enforcement and those who are hired as law enforcement to lynch black people in a number of ways. Institutionalized racism has lynched too many black people, either because they lost their job or they had a glass ceiling put on top of them. Their opportunity stunted because of the color of their skin. And so now we've got people talking about defunding the police department. You can't throw out people with good intention and who operate in an honest, trustworthy, ethical manner. But you do need to take most care police of do. Most police do. Well, because you know why? It's their contract language. And I've, I've negotiated many a teacher contract. But we don't have any contract language that says you are protected against the molestation of children. And the union does not protect a teacher who is accused of touching a child inappropriately. Does it, and they will send you to an appropriate attorney. And if you're acquitted, okay, acquitted, then they will reimburse your legal expenses, but we don't pay legal expenses mm. to protect teachers from inappropriate action. Police departments language does. It protects them. That's why you don't see tape recordings, body camera tape recordings, or vocal or verbal tape recordings, 911, released because their contract says they're not releasing it. They'll release what they want to. They're to protect they that officer. And you know, uh, Van Jones was talking, That's he's wrong. the attorney, and he was talking yeah, about to change that now. you can't sue a cop individually. And once they join the force, basically they're part of a gang, and that gang is going to back each other up. And so there's no accountability. Is, and, yeah. and it's called an injury to one is an injury to all. Well, the same thing now applies for African Americans. You have injured and killed and lynched George Floyd. And we have seen through benefit of technology, people recording this over and over again. You can't kill black folks or white folks without consequence. But the problem is it's disproportionate. When you look who's sitting in prison, you know how much leverage cops have to kill or lynch or stunt someone's life. And I think people have seen enough. But being cooped up with a pandemic only helps. It only helps because it's focused. Yeah, but, and, and it was something about this video, too. I was hearing different people talk about it, that the framing of it, like seeing his face looking right into the camera with his hands in his pockets, mm -hmm. and then seeing George's face right there on the ground calling for his mom. I mean, just almost cinematically, maybe it's the movie industry or something, but something about that video and all of us being at home and, and, he, over and, over. And, and you know what? When I look at the fact that Chauvin, right, had his hands in his pocket and he's posing, mm -hmm. right? No matter how much of a psychopath you are, it was a statement. It was a, he knew that the camera was on him. How could you not know that the camera was on you? So he, he knew what was happening. And yeah, it was a statement. He knew what was going on. It's like this, this is what's happening. And we can do this, and it's, it's, and it's okay. Yeah. But he had 18 complaints of excessive force Here's filed against him. I, I want to ask a question. Oh, before that. I want to ask yes. a question. I want to ask a question, Angelo. I want to ask a question, Michelle. And I want to ask a question, Marlene, because I'm asking you because I want your black opinion. He knew he could get away with it because of what, Angelo? Because why of his white privilege. That's right. Michelle, he knew he could get away with it. Why did Chauvin... No, he could get away with it. Be, for me? Yeah, Marlene. Okay. He knew he could get away with it because he was protected by his contract. He was protected by city leaders. He was protected by his race. Bottom line. 
This man knew he could get away with it because he had already gotten away with it. He had 18 complaints of excessive force already on his record. He should never have been a cop. He shouldn't have been still working. He had he was involved in five deaths of different people under his custody. Okay, same question for Michelle. Why did he why do you think he felt he could get away with it? Why would a person knowing that you have a camera at you, several cameras at you? What do you suppose and we're all just guessing, but why do you suppose Michelle that he well, felt like I, I'm uh, the still going to do this. That, the whole time that I'm listening to all of this and we're talking about white supremacy, you know, I'm also thinking about how just like the woman who could call the cops on the guy in the park and just have hysterics about the guy touching her, just like Emmett Till was dragged through the city because a white girl was killed, was, was, was killed and he was blamed for that. You know, I just feel, it feels like that white people have a history of being able to get out of situations where they're blatantly, you know, uh, are accusing a black person of something that they didn't do, but they know that they're going to be more trusted than the black person or the Mm -hmm. black voice, no Mm -hmm. matter what. It's like their voice has more power than the person of color. And so, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. I want to get to you, Michelle, and you might not, mm-hmm. Marlene. You might not even know this. You can get away with that when it's a black man, especially. Yes, yes. Because black men, in particular, Angelo over me, simply because of the complexion of his skin, is considered more dangerous. That's yeah. right. Angelo Colorism. over me, Angelo over me, is going to be Colorism. dealt with differently than Very I. Very differently. Yes. That's. Yep. That's what's plain and it's true and it's known in the black community. Right. And, I, and, and apparently some in the white community know this, others might not. And I think that's what, that's what all of this fuss is being about. It's not about George Floyd. Nobody's saying no. George Floyd was a, was a role model citizen. No. We're saying he didn't but, deserve to die and he was killed and it was made okay by Chauvin and all of his accomplices, mm-hmm. his brotherhood, because... Oh, this is a crazy black man. Yeah. We could, we could probably get away with this shit. But, which, but you have, you have yep. Tamir Rice, who was treated the same way. Mm-hmm. A camera mm-hmm. on him. But you Tamir also Rice, have so George Swimmy, who was 14, accused of murdering a white girl mm-hmm. and electrocuted. Yeah. And just four years ago, five years ago, they found that he was innocent. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Because that because it's you know trust and survival, yeah. We, you know it's it's a, it's all about the trust issue, and we and here in a well, throughout the world, the color of your skin means you can't be trusted. That's right. You your voice you don't have a voice, and you can't be trusted because you're darker, you're browner. And that's the thing. If you are a person of color, they don't hear what you're saying. They don't believe what you're saying because mm-hmm. the first thing people see is the color of your skin. Right. And you're judged by that immediately when you walk in the room, immediately when you get on the bus, immediately when you go in the store. You're like, oh, here comes somebody brown. Here comes someone black. Okay, you know we can't trust them better because they're untrustworthy and so I better watch them closely because that person is not trustworthy. They have the ability. But, but you know what? But I was saying in, in terms of my practice in, you know, metaphysics, et cetera, you know, that is the, the trust issues. That's the basis of all of this. And I really believe a lot of it is based on guilt. Of course, you're not going to trust a person that you have actually, you strip them of all their rights you know you've been mean to them. You know, it's like a dog. You're going to treat a dog bad, and then you're going to say, hell, come on. Come on and uh, play with me. After you starve the dog, kick you it. kick the dog, you got the dog locked up, and then all of a sudden you're going to be like, oh, well, you know what? You're kind of cute. I'm going to let you off the leash. That dog is going to be like, oh, no, no, no. And so there's that fear. 
of the guilt yeah. of just being mean and horrible to people of color. And now all of a sudden, you know, oh, they're free now. Ooh, oh, I don't know. I, I know, you know, my, my family has a history of being horrible to black people. Um, you know, and the, what I believe, I believe that the children, that now with, with technology and music and everything that we're all in a melting pot and we can see that everyone is, is the same, this is why the, the protest, you know, includes a lot of diversity because the kids, I mean, I, my, I was very, I lived in New York most of my life. You know, my daughter grew up in New York. She has lots of white friends. It's to the point where she had mostly all white friends at one point. And I was like, you don't have any black friends. But they don't look at each other that way now. The younger people have a li- they're more open minded and they know that their friends are their friends. They have more trust amongst themselves. Whereas the older generation, we've, they've done so much harm in, in, the, in the guise of colorism. You know, they've been so judgmental based on colorism that now they're fearful. Right. Can I ask you, Michelle, because, you know, we're kind of more in the city. We're in L.A. I lived in New York and Oakland, and I feel like there was a little more of the integration and that a lot lot of my friends, they didn't see the color issues as much in that way that if you are, you know, Joelle was talking about being in Poway or a community that's, you know, a little more removed from a lot of culture, how there were a lot of people asking questions and calling in for today saying, I want to expose my son or daughter, and they're more our age maybe, not the millennials, but how do they, how would Joelle help to integrate culture for her kids being in a real white community and for well, a lot of other people? The great thing about it is it's easier now because you have, mm-hmm. you have uh, media. You got, you got movies. Oh, my God, movies. You got books. You got, I mean, the, the movies that are out now are just – really telling so many stories my daughter is eight years old at last halloween she wanted to go as the princess for black panther so i bought her the costume i'm like go girl that's awesome but um then it, you know there was a movement saying white people aren't allowed to dress up like a black character you know even though she was just wearing the clothes there's no and your daughter didn't understand she no. didn't understand yeah. No, she didn't understand at all, but I didn't want to be judged. I didn't want to like post pictures on Facebook and have everybody come down on me. So we scrapped the outfit. She wears it for dress up at home, but she can't wear it out for Halloween. So, yeah. you know, did you have the conversation with her around it or did you just have to kind of mom it? Yeah. At the time she was a little younger. So I, I just kind of, you know, said, well, why don't we have something? But now we're having the conversations now being in third grade, I feel like she can get it a little bit better. And she's just, I mean, her poor little eyes, she's like, why is everybody so mad? I don't understand. Didn't this end in the 1800s? Right. I mean, what they teach them in, right. what this is teach them in schools, Martin Luther King fixed it. You know, Abraham Lincoln fixed it. Barack Obama came along. Everything's fixed. Right. So well, that's, she, that's the number one problem. Barack that's Obama. it. There, there goes the fear. I, cr- I thought it was fixed too. <laughs> yeah. it, just, it just it just took it just took the sheet off of it. It was like, oh, oh, we're good now. Yeah, we're good now. And yeah, then and then Trump, you get and then you get was, Trump. That's Trump why we got Trump. Trump. It's why we got Trump. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was the backlash for it having was. Barack Obama. Yep. And yep. I will tell <laughs> one of the things that I've noticed though. And when we, you were talking about the white supremacy that we live in, the TV show Cops, what is that all about? Mm. Watch that show. It's all about what black folks getting arrested. Oh, yeah. If, yeah. 80, 90 percent of everybody that shows up on a cop camera for that show. But you know what? They took that show off the air this week. Mm. Oh, this they took week. it off the air. It's a good thing because it's nothing more than demonstrating the lynching that black folks have been getting from co- police for years. Black folks and Latinos, man. Right. And you know... It's also a one-sided lynching show, which won't yes, really show is. the heinous crimes that are going down and being protested. And you That's know right. what? As I, as I talk about, as I, you know, when I start talking about this type of shit, 
You got black people and you got brown people, which are Latinos and Indians, right? And I think to myself, okay, but what about the Asians? Yellow people, yellow yeah. people are, it seem like they're in the they're in the area where it's like in the neutral area. Because they don't really experience too too much of that, you know, and I'm just like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Joelle and I were talking about that a minute ago. And it starts for them as children. They're perceived as being the smart ones. Mm -hmm. They're perceived as being the ones that will get ahead. They're perceived as being the ones who will make the sacrifice to get ahead. And they're quiet. So we, we mess with them a little bit, but not a whole lot. We're not oh, thumping wow. on them. But once you know? again, it's about the color. That's right. It's about colorism. It's and that's it. the whole thing. Colorism is racism. And I believe that the Black Panther film play, has played a big part in the rise of Black nationalism mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and pride in the culture. And acceptance itself. of it. And acceptance you know? of it by other than Black folks because yeah, ex ex it, was, exactly. it was put out as a movie <laughs> that everybody could see. It, it wasn't... Exactly. It was a Black movie, but because it had that comic air to it... Yes. It was relatable to everyone. It was yes. interesting. Everyone. And it was so, the highest grossing film, um, like one of the world's most highest grossing films worldwide, yeah. you know, because yeah. um, one of my clients, she actually worked, you know, she was one of the marketers for the film. So, you know, all that to say, I feel like change is, is coming just like your daughter, eight years old, she wanted to be a Black Panther. And then when we look at um, just the rise of just beauty standards and clothing standards. And, you know, people are looking at that. And I mean, look at all the women on TV now wearing their natural hair, the news people. I'm like, what is going on? Everyone yeah. wants to look natural now. And yeah. so with that said, there is a movement happening. Mm -hmm. So what, know, what if her daughter had gone in that costume? What would be the feeling from she, the well, black community? If she lived she in New York, me. it would be fine. It's just where you live. It's your town. You know, your daughter has like a, a, a more of a, a city mentality. So Not should she, man. like in the future, should you just go for it and be the but one to set the precedent? If you're going to go for it and set the precedents, you've got to prepare her for what she may come across. And yep. she has to be able to answer to it like she would in any other situation. But she's got to have her own inner strength put together. And she also has to have her verbal response ready to go. So Joelle, as someone who is aware of the black community, but doesn't have an intimate connection with it, has to also be able to, to you gotta do the her. same thing for your daughter that you want your daughter to have. So the same diversity you want to see in your daughter, you, you have, have to, to submerse yourself in that as well. That's right. No matter how uncomfortable it is, and the way you do that is by knowing what your intentions are. But you talk to black folks I'll because you want to understand the intention and you know where your heart is at, and it doesn't matter if you do something or say something that's offensive when you give acknowledgement to that and you know that your intentions were pure, then you change that because I've offended Asian people. Mm. I've offended white people. I've probably offended black people and never with any ill intention, which mm -hmm. means I had to apologize and I had to correct some behavior. And that's mm -hmm. normal. That's right. called just living life. I've told my daughter... I tell Cheyenne, you know, Cheyenne, if you're going to be wearing them skimpy clothes like that and you're going to go out into the public, you got a little ass showing, you got your legs showing, you got some, you know, you, you know, you got your kind of boobies, you know, bunched up and shit. <clears throat> be ready. Get ready. Because you're going to have some men that are going to react in a natural way that men do. They're going to whistle. They're going to go, hey, girl. Yep. You know, and so you have to be ready to how you're going to reply to that in an intelligent manner. Mm -hmm. Because just saying "fuck you" is only going to get the repercussion of, of 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 a violent boomerang back at you. So you have to be you have to be able to, you have to be able to react to that in an intelligent manner. Yeah. So if you want to be you. Mm -hmm. 
You know, so, and so that's that's the same thing. Like that just reminded me of, of what you were saying, uh, Marlene, you know, with your daughter, Joelle. How are you going to say, you can say, yeah, I don't see any color, but as a white person who might not feel the racism and you just want to be free, you have other people in your society, unfortunately, that aren't free under <clears throat> under you know, under white society, and they feel the barriers. They feel the gl the glass ceiling. They, they feel all of that. And so, you know, how are you going to convince them that freedom is the way? Mm -hmm. You know, okay, look, I got a character here. She's the white girl in the middle of the black flower, the, the black flower cluster. So it looks it's like a, a white a white girl in the middle, and the petals of the flower are and the petals of the flower are all black girls, right? Mm -hmm. Now this character was made up of a girl named Christine Forbes. She played on my, you know, she's a friend of mine. She we collaborated musically, right? She lives in Baltimore. She lives right in the middle of a black neighborhood in Baltimore, right? It's the same. It's the opposite of flying a buttermilk. She's a snowflake in the tar pit. She's homies with everybody because she lives there. She knows how to talk the language. She knows what's going on, right? Now, that what, what you were saying, uh, Joel, it just reminded me of this right here, mm -hmm. right? She, she would have to be a Caucasian ghetto flower, knowing the language, knowing the struggle. But at the same time, the Caucasian ghetto flower could automatically pick herself out of the black flower cluster and go to the land of Caucasia if she wanted to and fit right in and not have to deal with none of that shit if she wanted to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But she likes being a Caucasian ghetto of flower in the middle of the ghetto in the middle of black sisters because she loves the culture. She likes the food. She likes the look. She likes the flavor, the music, everything. The way you, the way to not be racist is to immerse yourself in all cultures and communities. Yeah. That's how you're not be racist. It means go learn, go live, go eat with those folks, go mm -hmm. eat their food, take your kids to the black community. You're like, well, what do we do in the black community? You do the same thing you do in the white community. You go find something to eat. You go what's, find the what's the lady's name that was a part the, the head of the N NAACP? What was her name? Oh, B. Smith. No, no, no. I'm talking about it. Rachel Doz 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 Rachel Doz. Oh, NAACP. Yeah, Rachel Doz. I'm sorry. Right, and she got she got a bunch of shit. She she was uh, uh, pretending to be a black woman, but she was uh, totally, you know, Rachel Rachel right. Doz. They have a whole thing about her. I on remember that. that. But yeah. man, she got so much shit for it, and I kept thinking to myself, I kept thinking to myself, why are these black people? giving her so much shit when she is in the position of advocating for them. Eradicating yeah. for them, right? And killing it. Mm -hmm. She's killing it. Mm -hmm. She was doing great. But now you got jealous haters, black people. Because she wasn't black. Because she, she was, was not genetically black. black. She was she was pretending. But she felt black. <laughs> she, she felt black in her mind, right? That's, you know, that's what in hood, that's what you call a wigger. You call a white nigga, right? Mm -hmm. But she was she was really doing a great job. I'm like, why are y'all jealous? And then once they got rid of her, then nobody stepped in the seat, right? She moved on, but it's like, goddamn, motherfuckers. <laughs> uh, Joelle, I just wanted to say She was a Caucasian ghetto flower. I wanted to say this about, you know, for you and your daughter, the fact that she wanted to be a princess. Because once again, it goes back to who she is. Because just her wanting to be that, you know, don't don't discourage her from her natural inclinations right? because mm -hmm. of society, you know, because if that's who she is, yeah. then you have to talk to her about why she likes that and what, what, what that means to her mm -hmm. and then empower her to and make her, her own choices mm -hmm. and be courageous in whatever it is that she wants to do. That's right. Because yeah. it goes back to with me. You know, I've, everything I've ever done has gone against my family values, you know. However, it's okay because my mother encouraged me and she said, you know what, 
you're just ahead of your time. It's okay for you to like these things and to want to do these things. Because I think the biggest cause of mental illness is when parents do not allow their children to follow their natural inclination. Exactly. And discuss it with them and ask them, why do you want to do this? And what does that mean to you? Because just because society doesn't approve of things does not mean that you have to follow that. That's how we change the world. We change the world with the things that are, that are given us within, Mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of great inventions, a lot of things would never have happened in this world. If people would not, if people did not follow their natural inklings and their talents to be creative and to write books or to make stands. So maybe your daughter has the ability to change the world and your community, but you have to encourage her. You to can't limit her it. Own guidance. Right. Correct. I know. It's that line between protecting somebody, yes. right? I didn't want her to get teased and feel less than, and maybe I'm projecting. It happened to me when I was in first grade. I think the first little boy I kissed was this little black boy at my school. And I got majorly teased for it. I mean, I got shut down and was made to feel a lot of shame. And that stuck with me. So, you know, yeah, you, so. you want to protect your kid, but you got to let them go out there. And Angela's the smiling. I like that. What are you yeah. smiling at, Angela? <laughs> I'm smiling because it just reminded me of when you were saying that the first boy you kissed was a black boy in school. What the, a lot of, what the clan would say is, if it's one thing worse than a nigga, it's a nigga lover. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? He was cute. Yeah. Hey, can I, do you guys mind if I, I'm going to single each of you out with a question that we had people call in with questions. A lot of listeners are white women, a, a handful. A lot of people are in different countries, so they're going to be learning a lot about American culture. And um, so, Angela, we'll give you the first one. Your thoughts on... Uh, all lives matter versus black lives matter. And if anybody else has something to say about it, please. Oh say. man, I knew that was I coming. Mm-hmm. Listen, as I go, I, I, I knew, I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. Yeah. Well, yes, all lives matter. Of course, all lives matter. Right. But I know being a black American in a white society, right. Black people and red and, and Latino and Indians have been the ones that have been lynched mm-hmm. and killed the most, especially at the bottom of the social totem pole, right? There shouldn't be any bottom of any social totem pole for anybody to be at in the first place, okay? But because of this... Mm-hmm. Angelo is holding up a $20 bill. This automatically gives this people who look like this, their lives more important than anybody else that don't look like this. So this is why I can definitely agree as a, as a black man, I can definitely agree to black lives matter. Yes. All lives matter, but you don't get, you don't really see any, any, any white lives being with a knee on their neck or being hung by a rope or being tormented or murdered in the street. You don't see any of that on caught on camera. What you see caught on camera are black lives being killed and, 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 uh, and Latino lives more than anybody else. Would, uh, would what happened to George Floyd, would that have ever happened to a white person? No. Not in that way. Not a black person is is accused of a forged twenty dollar bill. Now a white person, if that happened, they'd say, "Hey man, just give them the money for the cigarettes." You know, you don't yank somebody out of their car for a forged the twenty dollars. Right. Now that's what would happen with a white person, but a black person for. Officers come, they yank him out the car, they arrest him for forgery. Like, think about that. That right there, the crime does not equal the punishment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is where the problem is. When people say all lives matter, obviously it doesn't because the crimes don't equal the punishment when you're a person of color, especially a black man. 
In handcuffs. In handcuffs over something minor. Uh, to a family, they were protecting a store from looters. And they were standing there because they were like, this is our store. You know, this guy, he, he's like, he serviced the community, been here for 40 years. My family, we're going to protect this store so the looters don't destroy the store. There was a newswoman there. She was a Hispanic, you know. They called the police. The police passed by, you know, the people protecting the store. They flagged the police down. They come, and then they put, they arrest the people that were protecting the store. And the newswoman had to say, no, 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 they're not the people. If they, the people, were, they ran, they're this, they went the other way. But she had to intervene with the police officers and vouch for them, saying that they were not the criminals. They were the ones who called the police. And they had already had all of them in handcuffs. So when people talk about Black Lives Matter, that's what they're talking about. Because you could, you know, Julie, Julianne and I could be together, and if someone called the police, they're going to arrest me because of the color of my skin. And she'd have to vouch for me. So this is, a, this is where we are in the, we are an, a covert apartheid system. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're dealing with. And it's getting stronger and stronger now because, because of Obama and, and black people are feel like they've gotten too comfortable and, and feel like they, that we have, we have, we are rising up. Marlene, you were agreeing with that. I, I fully agree with that. And, and one of the pieces of, of data that I would point this person to who's asked this question is Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. When you look at African Americans are roughly 12 to 15% of this nation's population but represent over 40% of this nation's prison population. You understand that it is black lives that need to matter because we are disproportionately challenged, arrested, killed, and lynched in multiple ways than white. And I think this is why black lives matter needs to be the hallmark, yes, all lives matter because I don't want any other race facing what we we have faced. But what we have faced has to stop. It's a, it's a unanimous answer, and the the coined phrase "Black Lives Matter" bothers a lot of people. Um, I thought about it last week, and I said, "There's a lot of white folks that can't even say Black Lives Matter." Mm -hmm. There's a lot of white folks that can't even say the word black because right. they don't even feel comfortable saying the word black. They think they're going to offend right. someone. Plus, are we African-American? Like, because they don't know how to refer to us, they won't refer to us. They won't say anything because they're just unsure. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is black lives matter too. Mm -hmm. Black lives also matter. Mm -hmm. Black lives matter as well. As well, oh. right. As but, well. but we coined it to truncate it and just said... Black Lives Matter. To make a point. To make a point. You know, hold up. That brings me back to this. <laughs> Eat that shirt. Angela is holding up a flag that says fuck racism. <laughs> and that shirt. Now, you know, for a minute, I remember a couple guys in my band, they were like, Angelo, uh, or we, we, we can't say fuck racism because fuck racism is is uh, uh, too offensive and it's going to turn people away. So we, at, at one point we redesigned the shirt to say, uh, Oh God, like no more racism or something lighter mm -hmm. than this, something lighter than fuck. Right. And, and I was like, no, man, no, we need to say fuck racism because first of all, you got a lot of hard headed people out there. Right. Unless you get in their face and say, fuck racism, that narrows it in. Yeah. There's only one way you can look at the word fuck. Fuck is a negative exclamation point, right? There's no way around that shit. If you give them any kind of like room outside of that lane, 
then people can go, oh, it's okay. You know, we, it's all racism. It ain't nothing, man. It's all right. We can kind of get rid of it. Maybe we can get, no, fuck racism. Doing on the George Clinton tour with Funk, Funkadelic, Fish Bone, Funkadelic, Dumpster Funk. I would go out in the audience, right, with a flag that looked like this, but the pole was 10 feet tall and the flag was five by eight or maybe 10 feet long and five feet up and down, right? So I go out there and I wave this flag all around the audience, right? Walk around in the audience and waving this flag right before we go before we go on stage, right? So I remember we were in <laughs> Northern California at this venue and I was waving the flag. So the security comes up to me and he goes, you can't do that. And I was like, why not? Well, that's all. That's all. He, I couldn't even remember the word he said after that. I don't even think he came up with a word. He said, that, that's not right. I'm like, of course it's right. Look at the whole phrase. Don't you feel the same way? Well, uh, and then he got, then he got off his walkie talkie and he had to say, well, you know, this guy's out there. I'm like, hey man, I'm the lead singer, man. You know, this is a part of the show. I'm not going right? anywhere. So, and all of a sudden, the crowd started booing. Boo, boo, the crowd started booing and shit. Then he got a call from his guy. He said, let him go ahead. He says, I'm like, thank you, man. Thank you. You know, we shook hands. I went ahead. You know, got grandma and grandpa taking pictures next to me on the flag. Right? Then this other city we were in, the security told me to take, uh, take the flag away, right? So I took the flag and I went ahead, went ahead and I waved the flag on backstage and put it away. Then I got up on stage and I said, you know, I said to everybody, I said, it said, well, it said, you know, Angelo, you know, you can't do that because it's kids in the audience, right? I'm like, okay. So I went on stage and I said, okay, all you kids out there, mom, dad, kids, you know, they just told me to put the fuck racism flag away. So, but we all know that there's racism in this country, right? And so we don't want our kids cursing. We don't want our kids to say, fuck but when it's something as bad as racism and if your kids have been a victim of racism right i want y'all to stand up whoever it may has been a victim of racism right so you got all these kids standing starting to stand up and shit <laughs> and i say okay look it's not good to have your kids saying fuck but you should also you should be able to teach your kids to say fuck racism because we don't want racism to be in the picture anymore, just like cancer. Right. Fuck cancer. Fuck racism. And they all go, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And fuck you if you don't like it. <laughs> and everybody goes, go, yeah. And then we went to the first song and that was it. That's beautiful. I wanted to ask two more questions. I'll <laughs> ask them together. But tell me, whoever wants to answer, maybe we can make answers. I don't know. Quick but answers and get out. Two other questions, which is kind of big, but uh, what do you say to white people who are afraid to get into a dialogue like this with black folks for fear of doing it wrong? Okay, that's one. The other one is, what can we do now? And what could we do that lasts? Okay. Let me address the what we can do now. What we can do now, if, first of all, the, let me answer the first question. The first question is, what do we do if we want to get involved and we want to engage in conversation and we don't want to do it wrong? This is like anything else you learn. You cannot have fear of failure if you're going to see, succeed. So set it up so that you can be successful and own up to what you know and ask about what you need to know and be sure that you're learning the lesson of what you've learned. And then, what do we change? We have to change nearly everything about what we're doing. From buying a home, the financial institutions have to change. They cannot be redlining neighborhoods any more than grocery stores can and still do. In some poor neighborhoods, you can't find a grocery store, but you can find a Popeye's chicken. Planning commissions have got to change what they're doing and financial commission con institutions have to change as well. Our political structure has to change. 
we cannot afford to have many of these people who are who are not signing legislation that needs to be signed and signing stuff that shouldn't be signed in our state, local, and national governance agencies. We need to vote. Voting is important. I think we've learned the lesson of why we need to vote. Voting is an act of a decision, but you gotta be educated about the decision you're making. You don't vote for the cute guy because you may be a dumb guy. <laughs> you don't vote for the pretty girl because she might not be the one you really want. You need to educate yourself about who and what you're voting for because to do it any other way is to get what most of us don't like. Yeah. And yet we have a system that is set up where they can gerrymander districts and they can obstruct the right of people in this country to vote. We have been talking for a whole three years about the near constitutional crisis that is happening in Washington. And it keeps happening. And now we're down to nearly what I'm, I'm very worried about is that this country and this man are setting up a shadow government, a shadow government. When you bring people in who don't identify themselves, when you're militarizing the, the armed forces against its own people, mm -hmm. this is the kind of stuff we see in other countries where, where there's a dictatorship or an authoritarian regime. Yeah. And that's basically what we have. That has to change if we hope to create a structure that follows the value we say we have. Our values are acting every single day. And they stand up there and say, well, this, we have, this is not our value. Then you better be operating on your value. What value is it? When you make a decision to pass a piece of legislation, who are you impacting disproportionately? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, everything has to change. And Black Lives Matter. And the structure of what we have is about to come down around our ears. And we're watching it happen. Hey, does anybody else want to comment on those last two questions? I do. I but I'm going to go after Michelle. I wanted to say something about just uh, in terms of white white people and the person who asked, asked the question. So first and foremost, okay, so this is, this is what's happening to black people. And now I want to address the white woman. So, okay, so, okay, black lives matter, right? But let's talk about, I know you guys may have seen The Handmaid's Tale. Okay, so when it comes to power, and so this is what people have talked about, you know, in terms of Think about your fears. Like, what are you really afraid of when it comes mm -hmm. to black? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it all starts with your own opinion and your own judgment when it comes to people of color. And I think that's where people have to start the conversation with themselves and their families. Like, in your family, what have you been told? What have you heard? What have you seen? Like, what has influenced your opinion when it comes to people of color? And then examine your fears. Examine, you know, oh, when I see a person coming into my workplace, a person of color, and that person is my neighbor, am I getting anxiety? Am I starting to feel anxious because a black person is in my office and sitting next to me? Mm -hmm. Or two sitting together. Two sitting together. Or when I go to a restaurant and they sit me beside a black family, Am I starting to feel anxious? Because that's where it all starts. Because those are your, that's your subconscious mind telling you to be fearful, your fight or flight response. So this is where it has to start with examining why you feel that way. And is that, is that like an automatic negative thought or process that you have inherently 
uh, placed in your subconscious mind and it's in your DNA. And then you can start to change how you feel because you're going to start noticing that it does not make sense for you to feel uncomfortable around people that you don't even know just because they showed up or you're standing or the elevator thing. A black guy comes in the elevator. Are you automatically nervous because, oh, here's three black kids are in the elevator. Am I going to be, why am I so nervous about that? What does that mean to me? You know, and once you start looking at that part of your behavior and how you are personally feeling about people of color, then you can start to heal from that. Because so how other do you than that, feel? What, huh? what do you do as an antithesis to feeling the fear with the three kids in the elevator? Well, you start rationalizing it and you think about they're just kids. That's it. Right. You know, they are just kids. Yeah, and think of, and you can even you can even say, Well, what if they were I, my suggestion is if you say, Well, what if they were white kids? Mm -hmm. Start a conversation kids, with yeah. them. They're mm -hmm. kids. They're kids. Called, hey, how are you guys doing today? What are you guys up to? It's called be kind. They're kids. It's called be kind and polite. Right. And strive to relate to people. Speak to people. Mm -hmm. Hi to people. Hello to people. Say nice things to people. Oh, you mm -hmm. smell good. Pay compliments to people. We can do that with all people. That's all right. Different, all different good. It's a practice. And guess what? It's a practice I've done all my life. Mm -hmm. The part of it is I do it because it makes me feel more comfortable. Because when you meet a person or when you come across a person, there's like these barriers. It, it feels uncomfortable because you don't know them. Be friendly. Speak to a person. Say hello. I know in the black community, we're raised to speak to people That's all right. the time. That's, That's why we right. say, what's up? How you doing? We acknowledge people. Black folks, if, if me and Michelle don't even know each other and we see each other, we'll, igno we'll have a, an acknowledgement with each other. And Angelo, the same way. It's just, it's the way we're raised in our community. And part of that is what has saved our asses in the community because when you speak to a person, you help to break down that barrier or you find out right away, oh, there is a barrier. Man, now, that right, right there, dude. I told my daughter, I took my daughter and her friend when they was like 13 years old, 12 years old. I took them down to Skid Row. <laughs> I said, let's go walk around Skid Row. They walk around there like this. They got their arms all pinched up. They right. got their shoulders all pinched up. I said, relax. Relax. Say hi. Say hi to people when they when they come down the street. That's it. Say hi to the fucking bum or the crazy lady. Otherwise, they're going to be like, oh, they think they're too good to say something to us. Right. Right? And so that right there, I had to break that barrier with them really quick. I'm like, you say hi to the people in school when you go to school. Say hi to the people on the street. So it's all about, it's, it seems like it's all about fear, too. Everybody needs to just go out there and not be afraid to talk to people because – you know, maybe a, a white lady would say, I do want to say hi, but I don't want to come across as trying so hard. Like, oh, right. I need I need a black friend. So I, I'm going to say hi, but then they're going to think that I must be racist. I'm trying to get over my racism. So I'm like, I need my token black friend or whatever. You always hear this too, but it's like, get yeah. over yourself and just get out but there. But you cannot control, you cannot control someone else's response to you. You can only control your behavior and mm -hmm. how you present yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and Joelle, you're not alone. We're all doing it. When I go into where I live up, mm -hmm. up here in Northern California, where it's mighty white, mm -hmm. I will be the only black guy in an establishment. And I'll walk in there and I need to acknowledge people. And I'll hold the door for a gentleman if he's going in the bathroom and we're switching we're exchanging, you know, and I'm I'm kind and polite. And I say, excuse me. And I have not, hey, how you doing? And I don't know if I want to say, how you doing, bro, to a white boy. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. Yeah. But I put myself out there with the best intentions. And then you just let the cards fall where they will. Oh, where they may. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's just the reality of everyone everywhere. It's just going but to happen. Course. But more times than none people are going to respond to you in the same way you respond to them. You acknowledge mm -hmm. them and speak kindly to them, smile at them, politely to them. That's right. mostly what you're going to get back. Some people. That's, 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 that's the Bible phrase. Do unto others as they would do unto you. There it is. Most people, most people have good intentions, I you know, and that's the thing that we fail to realize, mm -hmm. you know, most people are good people. 
you know, and when we go around assuming that people are not, that's what you're going to get. Assuming? <laughs> you get, when you assume that people are not good people, you're going to get that because you're going to project that, that, that feeling of not being a good person or being judgmental. And so, you know, it all starts with it. That's how I feel. And I tell you, I've been in situations where I've been the only, I was in Denmark. I was, they told me at a small, small town and they said I was the first black person they ever saw. <laughs> and I was like, wow, it was crazy. And this was in the, this was in the nineties. And I'm thinking I'm the first black person in, in your town, <laughs> you know, and it was crazy, but it was just like, okay, I just went with it. I was like, okay. You know, they asked me crazy questions about my hair and everything, you know, and I just said, well, you don't know. Yeah. You've never seen a black person before. I didn't feel uncomfortable, even though we were drinking wine at 8 a.m. <laughs> Can you close us out, Angela, with a beautiful, you've got so many good poems. And something that might be on topic. I think you had a couple. Well, you know what? Okay, here's one that's been here's one I've been putting out there lately, and it's and it's off of um, my Project Infidelica CD, and it's called Project Blackout. Project Blackout is what's been happening for the past 400 years, but they really put it in the overdrive now because of uh, you know the Archie Bunker Joker they got as the fucking president now, right? So it's called Project Blackout. And we need to stop Project Blackout. But let me just, I'm going to lay it on everybody just in case they never realize what's happening. All right. Vacation time is over. You've had enough time to air your head out. We've been waiting for you here at the office. And the company will fail without you. So off with that stupid Moroccan outfit. Here's your suit and tie where you left it. Red and black genocide and ethnic cleansing. We got millions of dollars sunk in this fear-based investment. Your pinstripe suit of armor and your bulletproof vest, bottomless black credit card and God complex, and an endless access and everything to withdraw from senseless murder down to straight up breaking the law. Mm -hmm. The Blue Klux Klan and the KKK Pasa prepared to kill darkies in La Raza. Don't you worry about a thing. If it's caught on camera phone, use your get out of jail free card and we'll escort you right back home. Well, Black and red lives don't matter. Time to kill for the red, white, and blue. If you don't remember the oath you took, well, we sure do. And you swore it on the dollar bill and the necro and the comic con. You said you didn't care how the peaceful white folks look. They're only pawns, sacrifices, and the beatdowns go on and on and on. Project Blackout. Project Blackout. Ah, project blackout. Snap out of it, man. Screw that hippie dip, patchouli, and beaded necklace. You've been living on the mountainside too long with the natives, and you're highly mistaken if you think education's going to save them because we're scared to death and full of fear, so we're killing. What we don't understand, that might be a threat to our men, women, and children. Causing a divide by hatred, don't you know that love is the answer? And it's top shelf and sacred. It's the reason why we're here. It's the reason why we're living. It's the reason for the answer. That's why our hearts are beating. 545 in Congress on the inside. 300 million of USA on the outside. As long as we keep them in the dark and keeping them all from being smart. Uh-huh. Saturating the airwaves with low frequency and debauchery and white privilege, and prejudice, and lack of education, with Project Blackout. Project Blackout. Ah, Project Blackout. You always want to keep that free-spirited feeling. Don't let them turn your sky into a ceiling. There you go. This is Dr. Mad Vibe right here. Your comprehensive linkologist recommending that you arm yourself with a protective prophylactic coat in the consciousness. Thank you, Angela. Peace out. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. That's beautiful. Thank you, Mouse and Weens, for an opportunity to talk and educate and learn a little bit from, from each other. Thank you, Marlene, for making the time. 
Right on. Thank you, thank you Marlene. Thank you both. And thank it you, was so fabulous well. to meet and you. And Julianne and Ahmad. Thank you, everybody. We are so honored to have you here. You're all such beautiful people. And such just a love pleasure. you, everyone. Such a pleasure. Thank you so well for everyone, you guys. That's right. Yes. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Everything from this episode is on mouseandweens.com, and the video version is on YouTube. We'd love your feedback, so please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or Pod Chaser. Also, please share and tell your friends because that is the best way we can grow. Follow us on all the socials at mouseandweens.com where we have been posting donation sites and causes that we believe in. Our private Facebook group has behind the scene photos and our Patreon has commercial free episodes, the full unedited episode, videos, outtake swag, and more bonus content. So we hope you become part of the family and join us there. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. I couldn't be one of the other.